One kind of reason I talk is I, if it's not, I'm trying to get you to understand something about the way the world is. I'm trying to I convey it would be to convey information. Water freezes at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. And as soon as I say those words just like they are, I've, I've done what I'm supposed to have done. I'm, trying, I'm conveying information. If you don't get it, it's your problem. There's another way I can use language, though, and that's to try to get a particular <coughs> response from you. Okay? Try to get a particular response. One I used many, many years ago. When our children were long, I might say to my wife, oh, there's a loose thread on your dress. And I could use that sentence, one, convey information about her appearance to my wife. Or I could just be trying to distract her because the babysitter was 20 minutes late and she was feeling very worried about it. <laughs> okay? So you see the difference there. The second kind of linguistic performance, if you will, requires something from the other in order to be successful. In a way that the conveyance of information doesn't. You just put it out there. When the rockets go up, who cares where they come down? It's not my department, said Werner von Braun. <laughs> uh, <laughs> are you all too young to remember that? <laughs> <laughs> Tom <Larry> <laughs> uh, so, if you think of Confucius, even though when my colleague, when Roger and I translated this, we had to put almost all the sentences in the indicative mood, see them as gentle imperatives. See them as gentle imperative. That's what a very large number of them are. And to find out why that answer comes, you have to have a sense of who the st which particular student asked it. That's why the most opaque parts of the text are those passages where you don't know who asked the question. Sometimes you're not even sure whether it's Confucius answering it or someone else. And those do tend to be the most difficult um, of, the, of the passages in the text to understand. But the more you know about the student who asks, and the more you see, learn what it is that Confucius is trying to do, he's trying obviously to get each one to maximize their own talents and abilities, to help them realize their hopes, overcome their fears. In other words, he's in many respects a practicing psychotherapist, as we would, as we would classify it today, um, with the major added twist of not only getting the students to, to do the right thing, but to learn to take pleasure from it. That's strange, and it's another huge difference between the pattern of thinking here, especially in ethics. For Kant, if you ask, well, what is my duty? It's almost certainly what you're least inclined to want to do. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> it's just, you know, I don't want to do that, but that's my duty. Uh, otherwise, I can't make it. A, I can't will it to become a universal law. Um, so it's okay not to like doing your duty as long as you do it. All right? That's not good enough for Confucius. Look at two seven or two eight. You get the hang there in there as well of what he's trying to instill in them. Those are both on, on filial piety. <coughs> Family reverence, as Roger and I translated the term in our other translation. Uh, so you excuse me, asked about filial conduct, and the master replied, those today who are filial are considered so because they are able to provide for their parents. But even dogs and horses are given that much care. You don't respect your parents. What's the difference? Respect also has the sense of awe and reverence as well as simply respect. And 2.8, when 
Sir Shah asked about filial conduct. The master replied, it lies in showing the proper countenance. As for the young contributing their energies when there is work to be done, deferring to their elders when there is wine and food to be had, how can merely doing this be considered filial? So Confucius is trying to get the, the, the young people to follow the way, so to speak, the Tao, the human way, to do what is proper and appropriate, <coughs> and also to want to do it, and to derive satisfaction from its performance. Satisfaction that has aesthetic, ethical, and spiritual implications. Now, you are a lovely group. I've given you about four days worth of lecture. <laughs> <laughs> In the space of a half hour. Will you catch our breath for a minute? What kind of questions or comments <coughs> on that much before I, I, I go on? Um, see this, it is different. And I'm obviously pointing out the differences. There are a lot of similarities. And you'll see different similarities, some of, some of you, the mothers will see similarities, or that I will, that are there. But it is, you have to make the book your own. It doesn't mean that all the Chinese characters in the middle of our lines here are just a bunch of Rorschach plots. There are some, some interpretations of the text that are just bad. Okay. <laughs> And you can know that because they conflict with too many other things that are in the text. The language is forced or strained. That is, there are a lot of ways to read the text, but there are constraints. The words on the page, they're there. Not everything is a possible reading of the analects. Right? But within that, there is a lot of leeway we have. Why? Because Confucius' students were different people and different people yet read the elements. So this might be a very keen, the best reading for you to give, and a secondary reading for some, oh yeah, I see where you got that, but I don't think that's the main message there. And part of that reason is going to lie in ways of interpreting the ambiguity of the Chinese or the English. You now there's going to be the difference between you and another person. Mm -hmm. So what you want to look for then is what is an appropriate reading to give to the text. Not a right interpretation, just like you're not supposed to ever do what's right as opposed to what's wrong. That suggests there's some objective standard out there which you got from God or we know not who, that when you do the right thing, it is right objectively full stop. You're to do what's appropriate at all times. And ways of It'll be hard for you to catch up when you mm -hmm. do during a break. Somebody else can try to fill you yeah, in. Yeah, Donna just did a little. Oh, okay. Yeah, so <laughs> you condensed that into. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Oh, I bit that wordy. Uh, um, um, you come to think of whether what Confucius had in time to say, is that what is that true? What he says is that true? Can I believe that? Is that true? And I want to get you to try to ask instead, is that appropriate? Is that an appropriate thing to say? Uh, the reason for that is because there isn't any word for true and false in Chinese either. That is, you will read this from beginning to end, and it's overwhelmingly just conversations. And there is no expression in there that comes out that's true. That's true. There's no word for truth. No word for sentence in Confucius' time. Statement, connotation, reference, denotation, semantics. 
any of the words that we need to talk about a theory of truth are not there in the classical text. And we're very hard, if we see Confucius therefore as trying to convey information, then you really ought to have a couple of words that will tell you when you think the information is being conveyed accurately or inaccurately. And true and false do that very well. But if you haven't got any words for true or false, or any of the words that go with them, reference, meaning, so on, connotation, what's going on there? Maybe he's using language as a social practice in a different way, trying to elicit a response from a student. In which case, if he does it well, we'll be inclined to say he, did, he said the appropriate thing. If he didn't do it well, or the student has had a change of heart, then perhaps what he said was inappropriate. <coughs> and lo and behold, the Chinese do have words for appropriate, and it can be negated, mui, inappropriate. So you can start seeing how an pieces of an interpretation can be woven together. It's one thesis to say that don't look at the text as him basically conveying information about how the world was, is, or will be. See him as working with his students one-on-one -on -one and trying to make his response appropriate to the situation. Now there's another piece, say, wait a minute, there's no word for true or false in this book or in the lexicon in general from the, the Chinese of, of that time period comes in much, much later when the Buddhists come to China. Something like the concept of truth, but even then it's not the notion of conformity to the world so, uh, in, in, in that way. You kind of see how those two readings will kind of reinforce one another, giving each one a little more strength. It's not that they're necessarily the correct interpretation, but that's the way you can arrive at interpretations by having reinforcing. A lot of people just say, well, look, he's just contradicting himself you know, regularly. And you should give pause to say, it's really hard, difficult to suggest that the person recognized as its greatest thinker by one of the most well-known, famous, and long-lived civilizations, they were honoring a, a dope. <laughs> Very hard to take that seriously, even though, unfortunately, staggering number of my professional colleagues have been doing it for hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. Confucius knew nothing of morals <laughs> or to be human. He only gave etiquette lessons to princes. It's an annual Kant, one of our few five-star philosophers, one of our few can say things like that. <coughs> Can I see a hand up? Yes, I was just going <clears throat> to, to so I can follow this. Is it, there's a couple things that come into my mind. Is, that, is it the same as saying that there is no right or wrong answer? That it's the, it's the how the, the student is perceiving it? Or, and the other thing that comes to mind is the idea of it is what it is. You know, and I wonder like, how those things play into um, the intellects and how they're presented, because I know in in thinking about you know having different students coming and, and speaking to different students that you know you let them sort of come up with the answer is that is that what we're talking about in terms of the approach to that is more it, it's not the socratic if you see the, the, what you just said if you that's a reference to the socratic method right. of drawing out the yeah. jacare to draw out he's not so much doing that as that's a very very good question he's not so much doing that um, as he is, if a student is inclined to want to go this way, he might say, you know, why do you want to do that? And, and to see what comes. But he'll always be looking at, he'll be trying to understand the person's heart as well as what we call the head. The, the seat of, uh, of knowledge in China is also the seat of the emotions. There's only one word, heart. Mm -hmm. Originally it was a picture of, a stylized picture of the aorta. Uh, of, of people, mm -hmm. and that's the Chinese think and feel with exactly the same organ. Mm -hmm. So um, 
it is for them there would be no thought that was entirely devoid of emotions, no idea, no belief. And there'd be no emotion that was entirely devoid of intellectual content or mm -hmm. cognitive content. Uh, um, and so there are For certain rituals, they simply have to be performed in a certain way. You can violate any ritual as long as the occasion demands, as long as it would be inappropriate to follow the ritual, mm -hmm. then you, you, you must not. There was an absolute a prohibition against siblings touching their spouses in any way. That's because all of the children live in the same household with mother and father, and you couldn't have, you know, older brother winking at younger brother's wife too many times without family difficulties. <laughs> <coughs> um, it's an ab a prohibition. But uh, one of Mencius, who was the second sage mm -hmm. after Confucius, one of his students says, "If your sister-in-law is is drowning, can you pull out your hand to help her?" You. <laughs> what a stupid thing to say. <laughs> uh, and that's, so of course you violate right. the ritual. Right. And, and it's, it's not like you're a dumbass. How can you be so unthinking, unfeeling, so much like a martinet uh -huh. you know, to, be, to be behaving in that way? Now, if someone else is, well, suppose I held out a stick for her. Confucius might like that guy better. <laughs> <laughs> okay? Yes, uh, to yes. do it that way. Yes. So, yeah, the reason I hesitated at first is because unless the reason can be given for it, the ritual should be performed just right. Mm -hmm. And when you see that big word, ritual, it's the second most, com third most common term in, in the text. Don't just be thinking of bar mitzvahs and weddings <laughs> and funerals. Yeah. Think of shaking hands. Mm -hmm thinking of leave takings, thinking of sharing bread and wine together, the little rituals, pleased to meet you. So there too, there are ways of following the protocol. A bad way to shake hands is just to hold out a dead fish for your hand, you know, or to try to show out that you have good abs by trying to break the other person's knuckles. Or you can give a nice, you know, firm handshake and say, really pleased to meet you, something like that. There, even a little ritual, you can do them elegantly, you can do them gracefully, you can do them badly. Um, how firmly, how... You might be able to pass off a little more of a fish handshake if it's someone you are obliged to be proper to, but you know is a loser. <laughs> okay. Okay. So there, it's hard to schedule in advance. And another reason I'm glad you asked the question is because there are there are only a few generalizations in the Analects, and there are no universal principles. Mm -hmm. uh, and there aren't even, it is exquisitely particularistic. <laughs> it is not a universalist type of ethics or politics. It is altogether particularistic, where the unit of analysis is not the action of the agent, we look at the agent, the motives, and the consequences, some combination of the three. For Confucians, you look at the interaction. Who is doing what, with whom, and when? Okay, yeah. So, yeah. oh, sorry. Oh, no, 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 no Gail, Gail first. Then. Oh, I'm sorry, are you okay? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> so just following on what you're saying. So appropriateness, then, has to do with something that's runs throughout this, which, which is flexibility, not having to do with moral relativity, but sort of a flexibility, which is separate from Li, which I'm thinking is ritual propriety, having to do with the glue that holds society together. So they would be, choose that idea of flexibility, but ritual propriety would be sort of parallel lines. I mean, they're, they're, um, uh, they don't infringe on each other. Very good. That's right. Yeah, they, they, they do not. Uh, occasionally, Confucius does say, unless there's a reason for breaking the ritual, you don't break it, unless there's a reason for it. Um, take that, we'll go, let's go to, I think it's 9-2. Um, yeah, that's where I was looking, actually. 9-4, um, too. 
Is it nine? Is it nine? I think it's nine four. The four things he abstains from. Yeah, no, no, that's nine three. Oh, okay. <laughs> nine three. The master said the use of a hemp cap is prescribed in the observance of ritual propriety. Nowadays, that a silk cap is used instead is a matter of frugality. <coughs> I would follow accepted practice in this. A subject kowtowing on entering the hall is prescribed in the observance of ritual propriety. Nowadays, that one kowtows only after ascending the hall is a matter of hubris. <laughs> Although it goes contrary to accepted practice, I will kowtow on entering the hall. <laughs> you know, the kowtowing doesn't harm anybody. It doesn't cost anything. And it's contributing to your spiritual development, as well as giving another shade of glue, if you will, element of glue to your culture by finding it. There is a reason for switching caps. Sure, I follow the practice in that. So how the ritual is, when it can be changed, when it's no the ritual must always be changed when it no longer contributes to the flourishing of the other. Hmm. Okay. That's the question you ask, well, how do I know what's appropriate? Yeah. You have to know who the person is. The yeah. more you know the other person, the higher the probability that you'll be able to do what's appropriate. And the other is, this action, will it contribute to the flourishing of the other. Not to me. My job, one of my jobs for Confucius is to add meaning to your life, if you will, help you find meaning in your life. And he said, what about me? Oh, it's your job for me. <laughs> okay, that's where the reciprocity comes in, if you will. That was um, one of the ones I actually was looking at in um, uh, 116 where the Master said, don't worry about not being acknowledged by others, yeah. worry about failing to acknowledge them. Right. Yeah, that's exactly the, one of the ones that struck me is. It calls for an enormous amount of trust. He doesn't talk much about human nature, and his students comment that he doesn't talk much about human nature. But clearly, he, he, is, he has to be operating on the basis that if you worry a lot about others, you will find, lo and behold, others will worry about you. But that's not why you're supposed to worry about yeah. others. You're supposed to worry about others because that's the human way. That's the human way. Okay. Yes, Carlos. The, the last, uh, what you last, the last thing you said sounded like. Right, to act from duty, to act in accordance with duty, from duty. And so for someone like myself, right, trying to like wrestle with this, um, I, I'm having to, I'm, I'm trying to do the, read it on its own terms, right? Um, but at the same time, I find certain things that are like pushing me away. So I'm going to just say some things so that sure. you should figure out what my orientation is so you can help me figure this out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, when I'm looking at, um, so, some, so when I was looking at this, my, uh, my, my comparison wasn't necessarily to the Bible so much as the pre-Socratics, which to me makes sense because they're fragments and testimony mm. to a certain degree, right? So, so when, when we ask the question, what is the meaning of life, and we see that in, uh, I see it in, in, Hellenist, in the Hellenistic tradition, which <coughs> isn't uh, Christian in that sense, right? And so... But I like the way that you phrase it in the sense of like, what is the meaning in life? And if you look at Plato, for example, you could really, and you could, you could use that with Plato as well, if we, if we accept that the meaning of life is something related to the unexamined life is not worth living that we find in the apology, that's not necessarily saying what is the meaning of life, but what is the meaning of life, right? Socrates is sort of telling you to examine your life, right? But then uh, when it comes to the idea of making the book your own, um, and and uh, a tr an, a attempting to sort of establish some some form of like hermeneutic circle between yourself and the text, like where you're looking at your own orientation and trying to develop a new one on the basis of the text, right? I I end up bringing some of my baggage with me because that's I think inevitable, right? If you're because you kind of <coughs> do that. and I like some of the some of the, like your references to like Kant and autonomy because 
that drew, for me, made it clear right, that we couldn't go to Kant because, uh, indeed, for Kant, autonomy is required for something like morality, right? But right away, because, you, because of what you did and, and, sort of, and sort of pit Kant as, his, as a somewhat, somewhat of a formidable, some formidable opponent, right, it, it, for my mind, brought Hume, right? And so when I thought of Hume and Kant going at Hume, Kant's, uh, Hume starts to sound a lot like Confucius because you have the, uh, for Hume there are no true statements that are related to the world, right? Those are all matters of fact. True statements can only be made about relations of ideas, right? And then you have this idea that um, it's a matter of who's doing what with whom and when, and speaking to what Gail was saying, right? That's very much where you find the inquiry concerning the principles of morals for Hume, right? And so I'm, in my mind, I'm starting to orient myself with Confucius, right, in, on like this sort of Humean term, right, the Humean terms, not, not because I, uh, I'm trying to um, sort of pigeonhole uh, or, or sort of grab onto, like reduce Confucius to Hume, or the other way around, reduce Hume to Confucius, but because I'm sort of trying to grapple with the, with the material itself. And when I read philosophy in general, Western philosophy, I've always approached it as not uh, uh, attempting to get rid of, of as much baggage as possible when I read Hume or when I read Kant or when I read other other writers. So like if I'm reading other writers that tend to have a lot of contradiction, right, like Nietzsche or Sartre or even Carnap contradicts himself a couple times. Right? So when I'm doing that, I, I attempt to be charitable and figure out what it is that they're up to at that moment or what it is that they're, that they're sort of uh, where they're coming from at, at that moment, like, just like I find myself in my own orientation. Anyway, at the end, what, I'm, what, I, what I figure out, what, what I figure is the big difference is not so much with the questions that are being asked, but the supplying of justification. So, like when you say that, when you have Confucius, you have these gentle imperatives, right? Uh, Kant would just call them prob uh, hypothetical imperatives, right? They're either assertory or, or uh, problematic. But, but Hume has a justification for wh where he's coming from when he says that there's no true or false to the to the world, right? He has like these matters of fact, right, and so on. So there's this justification behind his principles of morals, which are there are no principles of morals for him, right? So. That's the difficulty I think I'm having with Confucius. Although I, it's very beautiful, there are wonderful things to be said. And when you have like, um, when you said, when Kant says sort of disparagingly, right, Confucius knew nothing about morals. It it also struck me because someone like like Hume would have said, well, great, because I I don't believe in morals in the same way that Kant does in like uh, universal ideals. But it reminded me of Marx, right, because Marx wrote a letter to Engels where he's complaining about this, that this, this university had invited him to give a speech, right? And they asked him to insert something about morals in his speech. And he writes a letter to Engels complaining about it, right? They asked me to add this thing about morals. I hate talking about morals. I don't, I don't think that that has anything to do with any of my work and so on and so forth. Yet for some reason, those of us that like Marx tend to find ethical implications about his work. And so how do I figure that out from... <laughs> How do I get from where I am now to understanding this in, a, in, in some way that provides a background for myself in terms of where my orientation lies? Um, <laughs> well, I'm sorry. <laughs> I had to do that question. Mr. It is, it, it, I, I wouldn't want to say it is in Carlos's case, but it, this is the most common statement question I get from my fellow professional philosophers. Overwhelmingly in the past, I've been doing this for over 40 years now, it's <coughs> if, if the things that you are saying are really true, then perhaps the history of Western philosophy hasn't been anywhere near as universal as virtually 100% of its philosophers have thought it was. And if there's really important things to be said in this text, then I didn't get good graduate training. But I did get good graduate training. Therefore, there's nothing of value in these texts because they're not speaking to the whole human race forever. And so it is consistent. Yeah, but see, like, uh, you could hear something that confuses, well, well, Marx said that, or Hume said that, or Kant said that. Now, you're saying these things in a different way, but notice not entirely. Right. Okay? 
But Confucius is sui generis. In the first place, he does, you're right, he doesn't justify. One of the just that there's no reason. Okay, okay, now that's a different question. It's an equally good, important one. It is because he refers us to our experience, the world of experience. Um, and he's telling us things about it that we, in, in the West, too easily for the life of Western philosopher is living in abs with abstractions. 98% of the world's languages don't have a word for deontology in them, or hermeneutics for that matter. They all have words for father, son, daughter, parent, <laughs> things like that. The world of our experience. We know, for example, we know we have one of John Stuart Mill's, I'll come back to Kant in a minute, um, one of Mill's most best arguments that are certain not to have any effect on any other human being. <coughs> human being or being? Human being, any, anyone. So what when I want to take up model railroad? That's what, how could that possibly be something wrong with that? Well, how much money will you spend on it? Will it take away from your son's college education? <laughs> when you where think are the resources of, coming from? Who, um, where is it coming from? Yeah, who are the workers that are creating that? How are we exploiting them? Well, there's no separation. Yeah. No, no. See, you ha I will argue tomorrow, I'll push this, that in an important sense for Confucius, you aren't an individual self. Yeah, right. You're the sum of the roles you live. Yeah. And as you live those roles, you will see that you are not free. You are encumbered 24-7. You're encumbered. And that can be very liberating. <laughs> so how do I, so this is going to help me maybe deal with my encumbrances, how to enjoy them. Yeah. Yeah. So there'll be, there's no word for freedom in classical Chinese either. So freedom, if we take it, cannot be a state of term, I'm born free. We have to see it more like something of an achievement term, when our responsibilities no longer have, are onerous for us. And we can come to do them more spontaneously, as we do with the most basic things anyway. You know, when mothers don't follow rules in caring for their infant children, if they have to follow rules, they're probably not going to be very good mothers. Uh, you know that. And Confucius says, you can make your whole life that way. It's just the web of relationships. Does this get back to classical Chinese? I had a question a little bit about the language, which you spent a long time, you and Roger, in the prologue. Um, is there no personal pronoun in classical Chinese? Yeah, there, there, there is. Uh, there are actually a, a couple of them. But let's... Let's take a break for a couple of minutes. Uh, and then I'll come back and answer that and a couple more like it with other words. Yeah. Okay. There is a, you can use it. But as Wittgenstein said, I is the most misleading yeah. of all words yeah. in the English language. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. I agree. <laughs> 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 okay.